Hello, I'm Suzanne James for Green Left. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land on which we live and work and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge all people of diversity in its many forms and champion their right to self-determination. Today, my guest is New South Wales Green Senator David Shoebridge. He's going to be talking to us about the arming of Israel and recent discoveries he's made in relation to defence contracting, his Senate estimates. Senator Shoebridge, welcome and thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Dan. And I, you know, I want to acknowledge I'm coming to you from Gadigal Land and um, the fact that sovereignty's never been ceded over this continent. And I know a bunch of what we'll be talking about the self determination in Palestine. And, um, and I think we should acknowledge that struggle. It's ongoing, of course, in Australia too. So what can you tell us about Australia arming Israel and what you've recently uncovered in Senate estimates? The story is moving so fast and there's so many things happening over there that it's hard to keep up. What can you tell us about that? First of all, we're speaking what on the, the 7th of March and the death toll now in Gaza has exceeded 30,000 uh, people, uh, you know, more than 70,000 people injured. The overwhelming majority of those people, women and children, um, and the thought that our government and our society might be complicit in that ongoing genocide, um, I think shakes many of us to the core and makes us um, uh, question how on earth this could be happening in our country. So, you know, seeing this unfold in front of our eyes and seeing our government, uh, I think, be actively complicit in it has been pretty hard. Um, uh, so, so what we what we've endeavoured to do over the last five months is to get some straight answers from the government and get some information about the extent to which they are permitting Australia Australian companies to to arm Israel, um, the extent to which Australian the Australian government is permitting the ongoing export of weapons to Israel, um, and of course. You know, the flip side of that is the extent to which we're also importing weapons from Israel, weapons that have been effectively experimented on the Palestinian people. So that, that's been a focus of, of my work as the defence spokesperson for the Greens um, in this important conflict. We had a number of kind of, I think, interesting revelations in the budget estimate session, which was a couple of weeks ago now. I think, Suzanne, you've probably seen when we've questioned Senator Wong Foreign Minister in in the chamber, in the Senate chamber, when I've questioned her about Australia's military exports to Israel, she repeatedly comes up with this line that Australia is not is not providing any weapons to Israel now and hasn't provided any weapons to Israel for the last five years. You, you've probably heard her say that on multiple occasions, is that? The denials are starting to wear a bit thin and the United Nations and Human Rights Watch who cited a number of occasions have asked especially Arab countries to stop selling arms to the United Arab, Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, um, presumably they're having the same issues with Australia selling arms to Israel. Some of the denials are starting to look a bit shaky, yeah? I mean, they say that their mandates for weapons compliance with the end user stops at the border, but how, how, how can they possibly police that? We have repeatedly seen the foreign minister make blanket denials about Australia supplying weapons to Israel and, and in fact, extend those denials um, to say that Australia has not supplied any weapons to Israel for the past five years. There's one thing I can say about that statement from the foreign minister and that it is false. It is a bald-faced lie. And, um, and to hear it constantly repeated by, by, the, by different government ministers is, is um, I think it diminishes faith in politics and, and I'll, I'll just might explain a couple of the things that were confirmed in the last round of budget estimates that, that, that I think unambiguously demonstrate that it is a lie. Um, rather astoundingly, the last time I asked Senator Wong about it in, in the Senate, in, in question time in the Senate, I asked her about her department's own figures. So the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade um, publishes monthly totals of um, our global trade, broken down by category and broken down by country. And one of the categories that they publish is arms and ammunition sales. And the definition of arms and ammunition is, is well, it's what's on the box. It's, it's arms and it's ammunition. It's tanks and missiles and um, 
artillery shells and uh, and, and weapons parts and um, parts of those uh, different weapon systems. Uh, you know, it is the definition is solely things that we would all unambiguously acknowledge to be weapons. Uh, and um, and her own department published the most updated figures just a, just a month ago. They updated as at October of last year, and they show some ten million dollars of arms and ammunition sales to Israel in the past five years, including I think one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars worth of arms and ammunition sales in October of last year. So during the current appalling genocide. Um, so I asked her about that. I said, how can you say there are no arms and ammunition, no weapon sales when your own department publishes these figures? And she rounded upon me and attacked me as um, providing misinformation um, and then sought to say, well, those, those sought to avoid actually answering a question about her own department's figures and then just went on and said, um, reiterated her position. So we had the chief economist for our own department um, who's responsible for compiling those figures in budget estimates. And I asked him about, you know, how the, where the figures are obtained from. The figures are obtained from exporters are required to um, fill in the category for the, for the material they're exporting. Um, that, 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 that data is reported to Border Force. Border Force provides the data to the Australian Bureau of Statistics. The Australian Bureau of Statistics checks it for um, um, credibility and for, for data integrity. They then provide the data to DFAT, who then publish it. Um, and the, initially, the, the, um, the chief economist, I asked if there'd ever been a challenge to the integrity of any of this data um, prior to the war starting in Gaza. And he said, no, there's never been a challenge to the integrity of the data in any regard um until the war starting in gaza and i said well you know um then it's credible isn't it and he said well yes it's credible data and then he said oh no 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 but um the initial data is self-reported from exporters and therefore you know they don't have any visibility on self-reporting and i pointed out to him what what exporter would accidentally tick the box that says arms and ammunition? No, you're going to have much higher scrutiny of arms and ammunition. You're not going to accidentally include something as arms and ammunition. And the definition is very clear. I said to him, it's what's on the box, isn't it? It's weapons, it's arms and ammunition. He said, yes. I said, you know, do you have any basis to challenge the credibility of the data? And the answer was no. And um, he then said, oh, you know, but you should reference defence. You know, defence have a position on that. And I put to him, well, Defence have don't, don't have any part of this flow of data. It comes from the exporter to Border Force to the ABS and then to you. Defence aren't even in the loop on this data. This is totally separate to their data on, on their own granting of export permits. And he grudgingly agreed to that. So we have the, the chief economist for DFAT basically saying that, yes, the data that he is responsible for publishing for publishing is credible and it shows some $10 million of arms and ammunition sales, direct sales to Israel in the last five years. So um, it is it is beyond absurd to have Minister Wong now say that her own, well, that this information is not credible and to challenge that information. That That's data point one. Data point two was from defence themselves. Um, when we when we when we asked the um, defense official who's responsible for um, the weapons export permits, um, uh, I asked him about you know this 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 alleged denial this this denial from the, the foreign minister, and I said, you know, there's been some four hundred weapons permits granted in the last five years. Um, uh, you know, on what basis do they say that no weapons have been provided to Israel in the last five years? And then he said his position was that, oh, weapons parts are not included in the, um, in the definition. And he said that's because Australia relies upon the, um, the arms trade treaty and the definition of weapons in the arms trade treaty. Um, I put to him that the arms trade treaty unambiguously includes weapons parts in their definition of weapons. I took him to the exact section of it 
and I asked him how he could make that assertion in estimates if they're relying upon the arms trade treaty, how they could make the assertion that weapons parts don't include weapons. And I've got to say, it was an embarrassingly confused and um, um, uh, contradictory series of statements that came from defence. Um, and and if, if they are giving that advice to their ministers, that weapons parts are not weapons for the purpose of the arms trade treaty, well, then they are obviously wrong at law and they are perhaps intentionally misleading the um, the government. And of course, the government would be perfectly happy with getting that advice and not wanting to investigate it because then they can make the kind of foolish, false, and I think politically um, convenient statements that they make about no weapons exports. So that's the information we got in budget estimates. We, we got, I think we can understand basis of the lie that's coming from the government. They are asserting that weapons parts are not weapons, contrary to our international obligations in the arms trade treaty. Um, and they have no credible basis to deny their own data, which shows some $10 million of arms and ammunition direct um, exports to, to Israel. Um, and, and, and of course, on top of that, we have bucket loads of communications that have come from individual arms manufacturers in Australia um, who were very happy to publish on their websites all of the deals that they have exporting weapons parts and weapons to Israel, at least until the 7th of October. You know, um, Raphael, there's a joint venture with Raphael, Raphael Varley here, which um, produced critical components for the spike missile that is being used to, to punch through um, residential build, resident concrete residential flat buildings in Israel, punch through the sides of the, the building and, and fire shrapnel in and kill all the occupants inside residential buildings in Gaza. The key component of that is made by Raphael Valley in Australia. We have a drone manufacturer, Kara Long Engineering in Tasmania, that is exporting drone engines and entire drones to the Israeli military that are currently being used by the Israeli military. We have this alloy um, steel on the south coast of, of, of New South Wales, um, which is exporting specialist hardened armor, armored steel to be used by um, Raphael Systems and also by another company called Plas Plasm to produce, to, to, to protect infantry fighting vehicles and armored vehicles that are being used in the war in Gaza and also to um, to protect um, settler militia that are being used in the violence in the West Bank as well. Uh, you know, the, the list is incredibly long. They used to proudly publish all of these details on their website about the contract deals, pumping this material out into the, um, into the Israeli military, um, um, you know, up until the 7th of October when it suddenly started looking a bit awkward. And then finally, the Department of Defense used to have on its website, again, until the 7th of October, and took it down shortly after, used to have a whole lot of detailed diagrams and explainers about the 50 plus Australian companies that are part of the global supply chain for the F-35 fighter um, plane, which Israel has repeatedly said is being used to bomb Gaza. And in fact, you can see images of Benjamin Netanyahu, the, the um, Israeli Prime Minister, standing in front of F-35 fighter jets, talking about the, the violence that he intends to unleash upon the people of Gaza. Um, Australia is integral in the global supply chain for the F-35, providing those, those parts, including parts to open the bomb bay doors. So every time a bomb bay door opens on an Israeli um, F-35, it's courtesy of critical parts produced in Australia. Um, and and you know, for some reason, as yet unexplained, Defence has taken all that material off, off their website since the 7th of October. Um, but of course, you know, you can't hide from the internet and, and we have all of those details clearly uh, articulating Australia's complicity in the F-35 um, uh, fighter program. So you add all of that together and then you see, you know, the Albanese government come out and say, Australia is not supplying weapons to Israel and hasn't supplied weapons in the last five years. And they just look, they look ludicrous, they look complicit, and I think they are deeply, deeply deceitful. 
One of the exhaustive list of suppliers I'd like to ask you about in particular is Micro Air Avionics. Now, they're a Queensland company. In 2020, Michelle Fay, then with Michael West Media, broke a story about them supplying drones, transformers to Israeli arms companies. Are they one of the manufacturers that are still simply conducting business as usual over there? It's just their web's gone dark since the 7th of October. Yeah, well, we, we don't know if they're continuing to conduct business, but we do know, and you're quite right to point out, and I want to credit Michelle Faye for the work that she's done in this space, um, and Kelly Tranter and others who have been really, you know, important in, um, in, in getting some of this detail out on the public record. Um, we do know that they've been providing, you know, drone parts to the Israeli military, um, at least as recently as 2020. And last time I checked, that's within the last five years. Um, despite what the um, the foreign minister says, um, and and they're likely to have ongoing um, weapons permits um, granted to permit that um, provision of equipment to the Israeli military, and and um, and and of course all of this would be answered if we had the slightest amount of transparency on our military exports, just the slightest amount of transparency. If if the permits were published, if the if the broad detail of what was being exported by Australia pursuant to those licenses was published, but we don't. We have one of the most secretive weapons export systems on the planet, vastly, vastly more secret than, say, the United States equivalent. If we're having this discussion, you know, and I was a senator in the US um, Congress, then all the data, we'd have all the data to hand, and I'd be able to list you what the weapons exports were, what the cost was, and, um, and where they went. But we live in Australia, and apparently that's a uh, it would be a gross breach of our national security if we, if the public knew what private companies were, what weapons private companies were exporting around the world. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's obscene for this, isn't it? I'd like to ask you now about Australia's international responsibilities in relation to all of this. Human Rights Watch and the United Nations, uh, there's been a number of concerns expressed about our involvement in these arms trades to countries either proven to have or suspected of being involved in genocides, yet nothing ever seems to change. And now you've said the foreign minister is engaging in misinformation because it's political expedient. And talk me through what's politically expedient about it when it's so obvious that they've been lying. And also, how do we get away with shirking the United Nations and, and all the arms treaties and other things that we're supposed to be abiding by in these matters? Part of the reason, the explanation for how they think they can get away with it, the Labor government, is because no mainstream media outlet is willing to publish the story about Australian weapons exports. I mean, it's they get this bald-faced denial from Penny Wong, and then there is, you know, an incredible weight of evidence to point out that it's false. Um, and they're un and, and despite us providing that, of course, to multiple journalists, it's constantly getting killed at the editorial desks um, of the major media outlets in Australia. And it's, it, it is in, unfathomable that they won't tell what I think is really, I think, clearly a story in the public interest, which I think people would have a strong interest in, in following, but they've refused to tell the story. And it's very, very frustrating, which is why we've resorted to um, um, uh, to, to put in a significant amount of our office resources into producing videos and sharing this information directly with the public through social media. And I've, I've got to say, that's been quite effective. Um, and, and there's, you know, I think it's part of a, a broader kind of citizen journalism that's happening um, to actually get the truth out. And I do want to credit Green Left for being part of that as well as, as getting the truth out. And, and, um, and it's one of the important reasons, that, you know, I'm here talking with you because I acknowledge the work you've done in this space too. Um, so that's part of what is the explanation. The other part of, um, I think the other part of the sort of structural explanation for it is that, that we do have provisions in the criminal code about war crimes um, and about genocide, um, which make it a crime to to be complicit in to partake in genocide and and war crimes uh, but they for those to progress to a formal prosecution in australia require the consent of the attorney general um, and of course the attorney general is in the government and you know um, and is is utterly and hopelessly conflicted in the space um, 
and you'd almost you'd almost say it was a an intentional part of the design so that both Labor and the Coalition will protect themselves from any criminal, domestic criminal sanction if they jump into the next illegal war um, or support the next illegal war. You know, they, Labor can feel comfort, com comforted that no Coalition um, Attorney General would, would seek to hold a minister or a former Prime Minister um, or, you know, senior member of the Defence Force accountable because they would expect the same in return. It's, you know, the political club protecting themselves from any kind of serious criminal sanction. So the law looks kind of good, but it's got this get out of jail free card for, um, uh, for the Labor Party and, and for the coalition, which explains why we saw the recent referral to the International Criminal Court um, seeking the office of the prosecutor at the ICC, the International Criminal Court, to undertake an independent and fresh investigation. And, you know, that's, that, that probably is a, a lack of domestic accountability explains why Prime Minister Albanese, Foreign Minister Wong, Defence Minister Miles and um, Peter Dutton have been the first Western leaders and former leaders um, formally referred to the ICC um, for investigation. How did that come about? That was a referral that um, was made public earlier this week. Um, it was a referral supported by some 100 lawyers, 100 or so lawyers, who have um, endorsed the referral um, that has now gone, I think it's under Article 15 of the, um, the Convention establishing the, the International Criminal Court. Um, and it's seeking that the Office of the Prosecutor undertake an investigation about the complicity of those four individuals, um, the Prime Minister, the Foreign Minister, the Defence Minister and the, the Opposition Leader, um, undertake an investigation for their complicity in the crime of genocide. Um, and, you know, that's, that, that is partly because there, there is no credible method to hold them to account under our domestic laws. Just before we go, Dave, I'd like to since we're talking about international criminal courts and misinformation, ask you about the current final last-ditch appeal of Julian Assange's team and also about David McBride, who I think we're expecting to get sentenced this week. What can you tell us about the current state of play in relation to those two matters? Well, for Assange, I mean, your your viewers would know where, where, where we're, I think, we're the 7th of March, we're having this discussion, just, you know, I think two short weeks ago, his final appeal in the UK courts um, was heard, uh, seeking the courts to to grant a, a leave of appeal, grant grant the right to appeal from um, a refusal to um, um, sorry to grant a, an appeal from a from a, a prior decision that had said that. Uh, Courts in the UK, if they get an extradition um, application and they get a promise from a third country, which is who's seeking to extradite someone from the UK, if they get a promise from that country that they'll be looked after when they turn up in that country and the UK government is satisfied by that promise. Yep, no, don't you worry, it should be right, it should be looked after. That the courts don't have to go behind that basic assurance from the government. They can accept the government, UK government's assurance and they shouldn't investigate whether or not um, they actually will be safe um, if there's an extradition. Um, that's critical in Assange's case because the, at, at trial, at the initial trial now some years ago, the, the, the judge found that if Julian Assange was extradited, that his health faced enormous peril. Indeed, his mental health was at such a state that he he may take his life if he's extradited and held in a maximum security prison in the UK. And of course, his mental condition has only deteriorated after years and years more in Belmarsh Prison. And that that decision by the magistrate was overturned on appeal. And on appeal, the the, the, the court, the appeal court said, no, 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 no. We don't have to look at that at all. The UK government is assured that he will be safe, and it's not our job to go behind that assurance from the UK government. So that's one of the critical parts of the appeal that's now on to the final Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court in the UK, to say that was wrong and they should have the right to appeal from that decision. Um, they've reserved their decision on that. Um, 
which means that the judges are going away and chewing it over and working out whether or not they, they, they're going to grant the appeal or not grant the appeal. One of, one of the reasons why I think there's a lot of hope in this, that element of the appeal is in relation to the Rwandan, the efforts that the UK government were making to move refugees to Rwanda, a kind of echo of the shittiest parts of Australia's refugee policy. The UK wants to remove any refugee claimant who's arrived by boat to the UK, remove them, you know, to Rwanda and just park them in Rwanda. That, that legislation that passed the UK Parliament was overturned by the UK courts um, because they said you, you can't just you can't just send somebody to a to a, third, a refugee to a third country uh, and assume they'll be safe um, with a promise from the UK government. The courts have to look as to whether or not they will be safe, and they can't just accept a bare assurance from the UK government. And they said Rwanda is a pretty bloody hard spot to send people with notorious human rights abuses itself, and we're not just going to accept an assertion from the government. And so it struck down that law and said, you know, it was in breach of the unwritten new UK constitution. So that reasoning obviously should apply to Assange as well. So that court case is reserved. There were other legal points raised, but, you know, um, and of course, if he loses that appeal, um, Assange could be whisked away to the, U to the US maximum security prison within hours. And that's why people are so focused on that. Um, David McBride, uh, his case, his sentencing was meant to be heard on Tuesday, the 12th of March um, next week. Uh, that sentencing has now been adjourned uh, until June. The reason it was adjourned was because the prosecution, who are you know, keen as mustard to put David McBride in jail for telling the truth about Afghan war crimes, they put on some late further evidence from some general who is asserting that David McBride telling the public about the truth about war crimes somehow provided was a significant blow to Australia's national security. That, that, that affidavit has only just been served on the defence and, you know, the judge could have done two things. The judge could have said, no, you're late. You can't put the affidavit on and the sentence will go ahead. But instead the judge said, okay, well, it would accept the affidavit but give McBride months more to deal with that and, and defer it to June. Well, the end result of that is, of course, David McBride's life is still on hold. I, I think he was first charged in 2018 with these you know, the, the, the crime of telling the truth about Afghan war crimes. Um, and so his case continues, you know, again, we, we see how committed the, the Albanese government is to putting David McBride in jail, committed to the point that they're, they're still desperately throwing evidence at the court to try and justify a, um, the criminal conviction and, and potentially a, um, a sentence of imprisonment. It's a, it's a tough world to tell the truth in, Suzanne. A very bloody tough world to tell the truth, particularly if you're telling the truth about Australian and US war crimes. David, I'd like to thank you very much for your time today to try and help us sort out this terrible spaghetti western that is Australia's defence contracting. Um, it just seems to keep getting worse and worse. So thank you for your time. We've been talking to Seth Green, New South Wales Green Senator David Tubridge about the arming of Israel, Australia's involvement in that and also about Julian Assange and David McBride. Thank you very much for joining us, Senator Shoebridge. Yeah, thanks for the chance to talk.